The Socialist Party of Chile was part of a second generation of Latin American socialist parties that made a much more conscious effort to adapt socialism to their country and region's local context. Partly for this reason, Chile's Socialist Party ended up looking very different from marxist Leninist parties and classic European social democratic parties alike. Although the Chilean socialists defined themselves as Marxist from the very beginning, their rhetoric and political style was always more populist than orthodox Marxist throughout the party's early decades. And it was not until the party's radicalization in the 60s that it briefly became an unambiguously Marxist political force. The Socialist Party of Chile was born as a diverse and famously undisciplined multi-tendency party with a predominantly middle-class base. It has broken apart and then been cobbled back together on multiple different occasions over the past century, and it has always been rife with factionalism. Yet the Socialist Party of Chile was also the one democratic socialist party that succeeded. It was the singular case of a 20th century socialist party that not only won executive power in a Western democracy, but then used that executive power to lead a transition to socialism. And for that reason alone, the Socialist Party of Chile will always be a subject of fascination among democratic socialists. In the early 1930s, Chile was coming out of a political crisis that had seen power pass back and forth between civilian and military governments several times. In 1931, Chile is back under the rule of an elected civilian president named Esteban Montero. But Montero is disliked by almost everyone, including and most especially his own radical party. In the winter of 1932, a reformist faction of the military is worried that Montero is about to be overthrown by either the communists or by reactionary groups. And so the reformists decide that they must move first and overthrow Montero themselves. The coup that outs Montero from office is neither surprising nor an especially unusual sight in Chile by the early 30s. But what comes next is unprecedented in Latin America. Later that afternoon, the new military government declares that Chile is now a socialist republic. The proclamation of the socialist republic was probably a largely cynical attempt by the military to undercut more radical left-wing groups like the communists. But it has the effect of galvanizing a genuine socialist movement in Chile that is separate from the already existing Communist Party. Chile is in the middle of the Great Depression at this time, and the message that many disillusioned and hungry Chileans latch onto in the wake of this coup is that life does not have to be this way, and that we now have a government that is going to help take care of the people instead of sitting back while everyone starves. The initial socialist junta lasts less than two weeks in power, but those two weeks are enough time to raise the national profile of many of the men who are about to found the Socialist Party of Chile. The most visible public face of a socialist government during its first couple of weeks is the Air Force officer Marmaduke Grobe. Grobe was already well known to most Chileans by this point for his involvement in many of the earlier coups over the last couple of years. But thanks to his instrumental role in the establishment of the Socialist Republic in 1932, his name becomes virtually synonymous with socialism in Chile throughout the 1930s. One of the other socialists on the junta is a civilian lawyer named Eugenio Mate, who is the leader of a small socialist party called New Public Action, which was modeled on Peru's opera. Other leftist figures and future founders of the Socialist Party are also appointed to the junta's cabinet, including the socialist academic Eugenio González and the anarcho-syndicalist organizer Oscar Snake. Most of these leftists are soon purged by a counter-coup led by the junta's most conservative member, Carlos Dávila. 
Dabele survives another three months in office before he is finally overthrown in a constitutionalist coup that calls for new democratic elections that bring Chile's long cycle of political instability to an end. For the 1932 presidential election, most of the leftists who were involved in the short-lived socialist republic rally around the candidacy of Marmaduke Grobe, who is also supported by several minor socialist parties that were founded around that same time. The 1932 election is won by the former liberal president Arturo Alessandri Palma, but Grobe's 18% of the vote is still an encouraging sign for many Chilean socialists because it shows that there is now a significant leftist vote in Chile that is large enough to support a viable socialist party. In the aftermath of this election, most of the groups that had supported Grobe's candidacy agreed to merge together into a single socialist party of Chile. As is often the case with parties that are formed through mergers, the Socialist Party of Chile is born as a diverse and multi-tendency party. It has some Marxist members who are either alienated from or disinterested in the Communist Party. And it also contains many left-wing populists who were attracted to socialism by the short-lived Socialist Republic, along with many anarchists, social democrats, and progressive reformists who had become alienated from Chile's radical and democratic parties. Later on in 1936, most of the Trotskyist offshoot of Chile's Communist Party agrees to merge into the Socialist Party as well. The early Socialist Party officially defines itself as Marxist, but its actual rhetoric and political style are much closer to Peru's opera than to the Communist Party of Chile. The word socialism means different things to each of the various groups that comprise this party, but the lowest common denominator that everyone can agree on is that Chilean socialism stands for unconditional support for organized labor and state-led industrialization. The Socialist Party of Chile is also a fairly personalistic party during its early years. And the popularity and public profile of the Junta member and 1932 presidential candidate Marmaduke Grobe is an important part of the party's appeal to sectors of the population that would not ordinarily be attracted to a Marxist party. Much like the Chilean Socialist Workers' Party a generation earlier, Chile's new socialist party grows rapidly by incorporating disparate socialist and leftist groups throughout the country. By 1935, two years after its founding, the party has local sections in most of the cities of Chile, along with many of the smaller towns, and it is especially well organized in southern Chile, which had previously been the almost exclusive domain of the radical party. Above the Socialist Party's sessions is the Executive Central Committee, which contains the leaders of most of the smaller socialist groups that had merged into the Socialist Party in 1933. Below the sections are a series of neighborhood-level base units that are initially called neighborhood committees. This map shows the active neighborhood committees in the party's Valparaiso section, which was organized by a young socialist activist in his 20s named Salvador Allende. The Valparaiso section's organization is the strongest in the heavily immigrant neighborhood of Playa Ancha on the northwestern side of the city, and in the mostly working-class neighborhoods on the eastern side of the city. In addition, the party's session operates several locales or neighborhood offices in the low-lying central part of Balparaiso. The socialist leadership was never completely satisfied with this territorial style of party organization, and it tried multiple times to switch to a functional organizational model that would be based on a person's place of work rather than the neighborhood where they lived. In the mid-1930s, the party replaces the neighborhood committees with a looser type of base unit called the Nucleo, though the Nucleos end up becoming a mostly neighborhood-based party organization as well. Later on, the party tries to supplement the Nucleos with a functional base unit called the Brigada de Acción, or Action Brigade. But this never really catches on in most parts of the country. 
During the Socialist Party's rapid growth in the late 30s, the party also develops a city-wide base unit called the Ampliado, which was officially supposed to be used solely for the purpose of political education, but which eventually transforms into forums for general public discussion, debate, and socializing, similar to the municipal assemblies in Chile's radical party. During its first decade, the Socialist Party also maintains its own partisan militia. Partisan militias were fairly common in Chile during the 30s, and they could also be found in parties such as the Radical Party, the Conservative Party, and, of course, the Chilean Nazi Party. The Socialist Party's own militia was organized mostly at the insistence of Marmaduke Grove in order to serve as a counterbalance to these more right-wing militia groups. While the early Socialist Party had some working-class support, a majority of the party's founding members were from the middle class, and the party's leadership came almost exclusively from middle-class backgrounds. Nevertheless, the Socialist Party made labor organizing one of its top priorities. While the Socialist Party did not have much labor support at the time of its birth in 1933, it takes advantage of the weakness of the Communist Party in the early 30s by aggressively recruiting socialist and anarcho-syndicalist labor activists into its ranks. As the Popular Front Alliance begins to form in the mid-30s, the Socialist Party's labor activists also play a leading role in organizing the new multi-tenancy labor central called the Confederation of Chilean Workers, which also includes labor activists from the Communist Party and even the Radical Party. The 1937 legislative elections are the first national elections since the Socialist Party was founded. And while the Socialist Party's result is less than spectacular, it does demonstrate that the Socialist Party has held on to much of Grove's vote in the 1932 presidential election. Just four years after its founding, the Socialist Party has emerged as Chile's fourth largest party and by far the largest party on the Chilean left. Just a decade earlier, the idea that Chile might have had a viable Socialist Party separate from the Communist Party would have seemed unthinkable. But thanks to the short-lived Socialist Republic, the popularity of figures like Marmaduke Grove and the Socialist Party's energetic but also highly inclusive style of organizing, the Socialist Party of the late 30s was well on its way to becoming one of the major forces in Chilean politics, and it had already achieved much greater electoral success than the Communist Party and its predecessor, the Socialist Workers' Party, ever had. But by the late 30s, the party organization was beginning to exhibit some serious problems and deficiencies that would debilitate the Socialist Party for decades to come. The Socialist Party had grown so rapidly within just a couple of years that it was struggling to integrate its new recruits into its still very young and underdeveloped formal party structure. On paper, the Socialist Party's statutes implied that it was a highly centralized party similar to Peru's APRA. But in practice, the Socialist Party of Chile was one of the most anarchic and undisciplined leftist parties in Latin America at this time. The nucleus routinely ignored and openly defied the instructions of the party leadership, and the Executive Central Committee never has much control over them. The sections are initially a bit more disciplined, but they become fairly autonomous from the party leadership as well by the early 40s. It soon becomes clear to the party leadership that the party's formal organization is dysfunctional, at least as far as party discipline is concerned. But rather than trying to strengthen the party organization, the party leaders instead settle on the expedient of controlling the party members through top-down patron-client ties that bind socialist party members to party leaders or factions on a mostly individual basis. This transformed the Socialist Party of Chile into a deeply factionalized party by the early 40s. Factionalism is not necessarily a bad thing for a party, 
and institutionalized and ideologically based factions can even enhance a party's internal democracy. However, the Chilean Socialist Party's factions have usually been more personalistic than ideological in nature throughout most of the party's history. And as we are going to see in the next video, the rivalries between the Socialist Party's leaders and the factions that they commanded will ultimately rip the Socialist Party apart by the end of the 1940s.